I'm Jacob Soberoff. You're watching HuffPost Live. Yesterday's manhunt for Christopher Dorner culminated in the fiery destruction of the cabin where Dorner had fled from police and holed himself up. But now that the smoke's cleared, law enforcement uh, officials are coming under scrutiny. Um, big questions. Why did the cabin go up in flames? Were the police out of line? Here to discuss from Brooklyn, New York, Max Blumenthal, journalist and best-selling author. And here in L.A., Wesley Lowry, reporter for the Los Angeles Times. Welcome to you both. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us, Jacob. Sure thing. Uh, you know, I want to just quickly run through some headlines I got on my computer screen right now. Uh, Chris Dorner. Uh, fire may have been started by the police. This is according to certain media reports. And uh, CBS News has a tweet here that says, just in, the San Bernardino County Sheriff says the fire in the cabin where Dor Dorner apparently died was not set intentionally. We've got some audio from the scene yesterday. Let's, let's take a look and a listen to that. All right, Steve, we're going to go, uh, we're going to go forward with the plan with the, with the burner. Got it. Wanted to, like we talked about. Seven burners deployed and we have a fire. Copy, seven burners deployed and we have a fire. So, uh, Wesley, you know, we heard very, very sharply there the audio uh, of police talking to each other um what what's law enforcement saying as of right now so, so what we're hearing now initially when we asked about this last night we were told that they had no idea what started the fire initially today what the san bernardino county sheriff is saying is that two different types first reported by my colleagues here at the la times two different types of tear gas were used the first being a cold tear gas um, which is typically not known to start fire the second which they referred to as burners according to according to police the second being an incendiary tear gas that is known um, to start fire. So the belief now is that, um, or at least what they are telling us now, is that the fire may have been started by this tear gas, but it was not intentional. They're holding to the line that they were not trying to smoke him out, or I'm sorry, where they were not trying to, to burn him out. They were, in a sense, trying to smoke him out using tear gas. Um, but, they, but they're insisting that they did not purposely light a fire and try to, you know, burn him alive or burn him out of the cab. What are they referring to, Wesley? Do we know when they say the word burner? What, what the, the argument is that a burner is, you know, this police lingo, police speak for this incendiary, this hot tear gas versus cold tear gas. Max, you've got this post up on, on Alternet. You, the headline is how law enforcement and media covered up the plan to burn Christopher Dorner alive. You've obviously got a theory here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this? Well, my theory is based on what I heard on police scanners uh, while the operation was going down. I heard what you just played, the transmission you just played. And I also heard um, police officers, sheriff deputies from the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department um, on uh, KABC, which is, a, sorry, KCAL 9, which is a local Los Angeles um, news outlet, shouting on an open uh, transmission, burn that fucking house down, burn this motherfucker, referring to Chris Dorner, the suspect, um, that I listened to them carefully manage the fire to make sure that it consumed the entire cabin. I listened to them deliberate whether the fire would burn Dorner if he was hi hiding in the basement. It was very clear to me that their plan was to burn Dorner alive using burners. I saw no evidence of cold tear gas. And what a burner is, is questionable. We saw the use of quote unquote burners during the Waco operation of uh, the um, destruction of the Branch Davidian compound by uh, the FBI. The FBI actually covered up their use of pyrotechnic rounds for six years because they were using military grade equipment on American citizens. And we see the San Bernardino sheriffs apparently doing the same thing again. They could have used ANM-14 TH3s against Dorner, which are hand-deployed um, uh, pyrotechnic rounds that heat up that are designed to burn through fortified structures, including steel plates and engine blocks, and create a temperature of over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is why, and I want to get to an important part of uh, some of the media reports about this, why we heard over the police scanners reports by sheriff deputies of ammo popping. In other words, unloaded ammo exploding inside, possibly after Dorner was dead. Now, the sheriff deputies have claimed the L.A. Times 
and the LA Times is the only out mainstream outlet to have reported the use of incendiary rounds. But the deputies have claimed to the LA Times that there was an exchange of fire, that Dorner was continually firing at their deputies from inside this cabin. There's absolutely no evidence of that. I heard no reports of that over the police scanners. And Dorner was probably uh, dead, burned to a crisp by the time that happened. So the deputies are continuing their cover up and lying to the uh, local L.A. media. And it's the job of the media to get to the bottom of this. Wesley, you know, we have a, a comment here from Dharma Dog Pictures who's watching us live right now. It says, you got to be kidding me. The audio speaks volumes. When presented with some of this audio, including the mf -er audio, which I heard myself also, that Max talks about, what are the, you know, what, what does uh, San Bernardino PD say? You know, you know, they're not answering a lot of those questions. They, they are continuing going back to the statement that, you know, this is still an ongoing investigation, still a crime scene up there, um, that all the an answers aren't going to come out yet. Um, now, we can't be completely satisfied with that, and I'd, I'd argue that we haven't been. You know, the LA Times has been out in front on all of this reporting, um, whether it be being the first to report the use of these incendiary um, tear gas canisters, whether it be being the first to report the uh, million dollar um, reward. You know, we, we are certainly sourced up and, you know, it would be disingenuous um, for me to suggest that we're not uh, following all of these things. We will continue to follow these leads and we will continue to get the answers to the questions about this. But there is one thing I would say, and I would caution, um, you know, there's a lot to be said for listening to police scanners because you do get a lot of this live, raw information, but you also get a lot of, inform a lot of information flow that ends up being incorrect. Uh, one great example of that would be during Hurricane Sandy, where you had people live tweeting police scanners and talking about hospitals being flooded that weren't flooded and talking about traffic lights being down that weren't down, because that is in many ways the nature of a police scanner, is that you're, you're getting different radio communications between some officers who are at the scene, some officers who are not at the scene, officers of varying different levels and capacities. And, and so that's just, that's one thing I would say, that's not to write off. That's not to write off some very legitimate questions being raised and questions that, again, I think we are asking. Max uh, or Wesley, either of you feel free to jump in, but um, as far as the legality of using these incendiary types of devices, um, you know, where, where, where's the line drawn? Um, when, when does it become uh, illegal? Well, the, the, the question, that's a good question. And the, the, but the real question here is, why is the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department misleading and deceiving the media and the public about what actually happened on that mountain in Big Bear? Um, and there must be issues of legality here that they are clearly worried about. Um, it's apparent that they made no attempt to establish contact with Dorner, negotiate out of it. He was, uh, they went, it appears that their first option was to burn him out, as they said. And, uh, I, you know, it's really up to the the media, the the local media, and not guys like me um, in over here in the New York area to get to the bottom of this. Unfortunately, the media, mainstream media at the scene was completely derelict and complied with San Bernardino County Sheriff's um, requests that they will not tweet updates on the Dorner search. Um, KCBS, the local CBS affiliate, said we are complying and will not tweet updates. The same with the Riverside Press Enterprise, which is a major newspaper, local newspaper in the area. Law enforcement asked media to stop tweeting about the Dorner case, fearing officer safety. We are complying. Now, I highly doubt that Chris Dorner was in this cabin checking up on Twitter to monitor officer formations. Um, so this is just... The, the, the zeal even, even if he was Max, you know, the, it, it's a fine line between providing a public service to the to the public as a news outlet and uh, and and having public safety. And that was an issue that we raised here on, on HuffPost Live yesterday, which is it is in in. in you know, in many respects, in all respects, the, the duty of journalists to provide information to the public. Um, Wesley, you know, was that something that the L.A. Times struggled with yesterday? You know, I can't speak for my editors and the decisions that were made. I can, you know, direct you to my Twitter feed where plenty of tweets were being sent throughout the entirety of the time, as well as every other reporter we had on it. You know, we've got a massive team that was working in this story, both on the ground, as well as, you know, back in the office where I was based much of yesterday. I mean, so again, I, I can't really speak for, for the top, for the leadership. But what I can say is, you know, we were certainly tweeting. We were certainly breaking stories. We were certainly working to try to shed light on what was happening there. And, and, and one thing I will add is that because this was such a massive search that went on for so many days um, with so many different uh, police organizations involved, there was confusion. There were conflicting reports coming out left and right. You know, 
on, on basic things like, do you have a body? We have a Riverside police chief telling us, yes, we have the body and we've confirmed it's Dorner. We have LAPD saying we haven't gone in yet. We have the sheriff initially saying, we've got a body, but we're, we haven't figured out who it is and we haven't extracted it. Then they come back and say, we haven't gone in yet. So it's, you know, I think there are many hard questions that still need to be asked and need to be answered, but on something simple as, do you have a body? We couldn't get a straight answer on. So it's hard to think that we would have the details at this point of exactly what the tactical movements were moving in to go get him. Obviously, uh, Dorner has committed very serious crimes and, and murders uh, or, or uh, accused of these very serious crimes and murders. Um, and we've seen this unprecedented uh, joint law enforcement cooperation here in Southern California. I said San Bernardino PD earlier. I meant San Bernardino sheriffs. Do you think that San Bernardino sheriffs, LAPD, um, are taking a hit in their reputation because of the way that this ultimately ended up? I, mean, I, th I think we have to let it, I think we have to let it play out. You know, the LAPD is one of the largest law enforcement, um, one of the largest law enforcement departments in the country. You know, I think that this has certainly shed light and brought up uh, the some of the ghost of LAPD's past. And, and there were definitely some interesting questions raised in the Dorner Manifesto and some questions that still need to be raised about how this was handled. But it's it's kind of hard, you know, I'd almost liken it to people, you know, saying is Marco Rubio's career over because he took a sip of water last night. You These, th these things that are larger than these individual situations. You right, know, but let's not forget, uh, Max, let me get you in here. Um, let's not forget, innocent people were shot here in Los Angeles, in the city of Los Angeles um, by the LAPD, you know, during this manhunt. What's your take on, you know, ultimately how this is going to affect the reputations of these police departments? Yeah, um, innocent people were shot by the LAPD, and let's say that, let's also just note that Dorner is no hero. He killed cops who were also fathers. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to say that those who think that Dorner deserved no due process, um, those who um, took, you know, killing Dorner as the first option are villains as well. And the media, by missing its opportunity at the scene to really provide details of what was happening, um, and now all of this is going to be have to be unpacked by uh, really good reporters like Wesley um, have um, put have put the public in danger, in my opinion, by allowing the police to continue their reign of impunity in Southern California. I lived there for five years. I saw how they um, how they acted in day to day situations. And it's very disturbing, especially when they have all this uh, military gear. So um, this, this isn't going to go away. And it's especially not going to go away because the San Bernardino County sheriffs are clearly lying about the cause of the fire. They're persisting in their lie. They will not admit that they intentionally started this fire. And everybody in America can listen to the scanner transmissions of them giving a very clear order. That is, it's not just uh, disturbing. It's a, it's a mass. It should be treated as a major scandal. And it reminds, and the media's behavior at the scene reminds me of how the media reacted when the Obama administration told them not to report a legal memo authorizing secret assassinations of American citizens. And they waited for one year to tell the American public that it, the administration had authorized legally, in their opinion, on the killing of American citizens. So this is an issue of public safety. And every American should um, be terrified by the spectacle that we just witnessed in Big Bang. You know, your point's well taken, Max, and hopefully we don't have to wait for the, the leak of a white paper to get details about what went on um, up at that cabin. Wesley, let me just end with you um, and, and read a comment from Ibrahim Sapien, who's watching us as well. He says, uh, he, meaning Dorner, killed an officer right there, almost killed another. What should the cops have done? This wasn't the kind of man who could be tackled alive. Have uh, any of the law enforcement officials said anything about the possibility of, of, of taking Dorner alive yesterday? They haven't said much, and again, again, they're they're not saying much other than these press conferences. But you know, but they had said previously. The police chief had said, you know, our priority would be to take him alive. People can argue um, based on the tactics they did employ whether or not that is what their priority was. But they're on record saying their priority was to take him alive. Um, and so, but I, I do think, you know, going back to a little bit to your earlier question, I think it is important to note that. This, whether it be the police shootings, LAPD um, shot at two innocent women um, driving a similar truck. Torrance PD, which is another city in Southern California, shot at a man driving a similar truck um, who are just residents, innocent people during this manhunt. It certainly has this man, whether it be the man manifesto, the manhunt and the shootout. It certainly has um, fanned the flames of um, 
fan the flames of discontent towards the police, towards police officers, specifically towards LAPD. It has forced the hand of media outlets and of watchdogs to ask hard questions. And and again, what I'll say, you know, speaking for my colleagues here, who are some of the best reporters in the country, we are going to continue to ask the hard questions. We have been asking the hard questions. And when they're not going to answer them on record, we're going to go ahead and use our sourcing and, and break these stories the way we have. Been. And let me just say in response to Ibrahim Sapien's comment, the police department is not the judge, jury and executioner. You know, it's it's not up to the police department to decide. Um, obviously, if it's a life or death situation, you know, they may use lethal force. And I think there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered about this case. Max, you're raising very good ones. And Wesley, you and your colleagues at the L.A. Times have done some great reporting. And I, and I look forward to uh, con continuing to follow the reporting that, that you both are going to be doing. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so everybody, much. stick around. We got lots more in HuffPost Live coming up tonight. The conversation continues as always.